Hi, everybody. Welcome to our May Author Connect chat. I'm Michelle, the Chief of Staff at BookPal, a bookseller with a mission to inspire continuous growth and learning using the transformative power of books. Today, I'm here with Rob Jollis, a long-term partner of ours, to talk about his book, Why People Don't Believe You. Yes, we are, and uh, I'm excited to be here. I want to thank you for uh, for listening, and uh, it's it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I um I, I want you to know that um, I'm just trying to get the presentation rolling right now. There we go. There uh, go. Uh, all right. That uh, now I believe me. Uh, I, I, it's a wonderful journey. You know, when you write a book, um, and I mentor a lot of authors. Um, I'm always asked, uh, you know, well, geez, you know, how do you get a topic? How, how, you know, what, what, how do you come up with these things to write about? And uh, I think it's a little bit like a career sometimes. Sometimes you don't find a book, a book finds you. And, uh, and by that, I mean uh, something in your life, something, uh, uh, something attracts you, something moves you, and you begin to start almost obsessing on it. And that's what writers do. So for me, in terms of finding the book, it, to me, it started with a, a request to speak. I actually was in a, a fairly bad mood at the time because I was asked to speak, uh, you know, for, for a group and uh, they didn't have any funds. And when you, as a 33-year speaker, I'm asked to speak a, a great deal uh, for no funds. Um, but so I have to be careful and I pick and choose. And and I don't know, I, I was sort of whining about it, but it was about a half hour from home. And I, I walked into a group of, of job seekers, people that were in job transition. I expected to see, oh, I don't know, 10 to 15 people. Uh, there were about 300 people in the room, and that was the first thing that caught my attention. Uh, what, I, what also caught my attention was the fact that the way they were being trained and taught was they were working on their resume, which is words. They were working on elevator pitches, which is words. Uh, they were working on LinkedIn sites, again, words. Matter of fact, pretty much everything they were working on were words. And yet these people and many of them chronically were struggling to be believed. And it wasn't really um, the words that were failing them. It was the way they were saying their words. So that began this Petri dish of people that I began to mentor and coach and try and figure out, OK, what can we do just beside just just other than massaging the words? Uh, what I also learned as I began to work on this in my own um, kind of sweet spot of clients, which is usually more businesses, is that this isn't um, a, a problem that's just associated with people who are seeking jobs. Um, it plagues a lot of people. And as a matter of fact, sometimes it plagues them so early that decisions are made in elementary school and middle school and high school in terms of career paths and things like that. And so it's an issue that we all have to pay attention to. So uh, to me, the problem that if we're going to identify the problem, the problem is really this. Um, we have to realize that um, obviously we've got to get our words together, but we've got to learn to tune to those words. And um, to me, that the harder we work at mastering words, the more unauthentic, meaning the less believable we are. And if and if you're struggling believing that particular statement, just think about the times you've perhaps had to give a presentation. And what was your instinct? Your instinct was to write it out, to write it out. And of course, as long as you were chained to what you wrote out, uh, you had the words right, but you weren't believable. So we lose that sound. That's the problem. Anyway, um, to me, when you do that, it, it begins to create a string of failures. And uh, these failures uh, become worse and worse. And it, it, um, it, it can plague an individual. It can change the course of a life. And quite frankly, I'm very proud of all the books that I've written. This one is the closest I've really gotten to sort of stepping out of, gee, I'm going to help you sell more. I'm going to, I'm going to help you make more money. This is a little bit more personal because I've been on the front lines now uh, of this Petri dish, of these people uh, for over seven years now. So it's, this is personal to me. And, it's, and I noticed that it's personal to a lot of people, again, not just job seekers. So 
how do we how do we get uh let, let's back it up just for a moment and figure out how do we get into the mess then we're going to solve the mess okay uh and i do want you to know by the way i'm, I'm going that everything that you see every slide that you see here is um we've created a uh, a handout and uh you're really dealing with uh, uh my first job and my my real job uh, other than motivating inspire and entertaining is i'm here to inform I think the in the motivating and entertaining part's the easy part. So I really want people who are listening to get this message. And I don't want you to have to worry about guessing what I think is important. So uh, we have a handout. You'll see all the slides on that handout. It's available to anybody who's listening. And we'll talk about how to get that near the end of the presentation. And I've created text behind every slide to show you what I want you to pull from it. So hopefully that, that'll lighten up your load and we can just continue to have our conversation. How did we get here? All right. Well, in, in fact, um, one of the problems is we don't really know how to do this. We have to learn how to do this. And what is this? Uh, if you ever get a book signed by me, you might very well get words, you know, go get this. You'll find this. It's all about this. Let me tell you what this is. And you notice the picture on the slide here. Uh, it, it, to me, the best articulation of the word this is found in a commercial that FedEx did a decade ago. Uh, and it's a commercial where you see a boss ask for ideas and an individual says, provides a, 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 an idea of how to save on shipping and the room is silent. And then the boss says the exact same thing and really puts a message emphasis and some energy and some vocal tone and some movement and, and hands and gestures and face and the group explodes and says oh now that's a great idea and the individual says I, I just said the same thing only I didn't do this and the guy said no nope, I did this and that's that's called the stolen idea and if you find it on YouTube and you will you'll see all sorts of horrible comments about the boss I don't see it that way I'm not, I don't really care about the boss and I don't care about the stolen idea we need to learn how to do this. This supports the words. This makes us authentic. So that's what I mean by this. Uh, how did we get in here? Reason number two, I think our soft skills got us in here. And I'm not blaming anybody on the, the line here. I'm blaming the word soft skills. I think soft skills has a PR problem. I really do. I think we have thrown that word around and discarded it and tr treated it disrespectfully. And take it from a corporate trainer, 33 years. Uh, we all know when a company struggles and the budget needs to be cut, where do we start? Well, we're going to start with the soft skills. We'll get rid of the training. We'll get rid of all that. You know, soft skills, even the word soft, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it's not, it, it, it doesn't promote confidence. Uh, I, I would like to start a movement that changes the word soft skills and, and instead, we could call them performance skills. But we discount these soft skills. And I will tell you again, when I look out into that sea of 300 people who are struggling every week and have lost their jobs and have been forgotten and have been left behind, not one of them are sitting there because their hard skills failed them. They're sitting there because their soft skills failed them. So we've got to treat them with more respect. And from now on, let's just use the word performance skills when we speak about them. Little has been offered to those to those who can't hear the tune. You know, think about it. I'm actually working with a handful of universities right now to try to put on programs that treat this topic with respect. It changes people's lives. So, uh, but how many courses do we see in school that really teach how to be believed? And Maybe it's just me, but what do you think? Do you think that's a pretty important tool to have in your toolbox? I certainly do. And uh, it, it can also, as they say, change the trajectory of somebody's life. And that's what I mean in terms of it's a block that falls. We just aren't clicking when we get up in front of a room or get up in front of people. And all of a sudden, we, our, our life has changed. We go in a different direction. Well, I'm here to tell you that I believe almost anybody, let me take that word almost out, anybody can find the tune. And we're going to talk about how. So what can we do about it? Well, to me, there's a couple things. First, we've got to stop focusing on the word so much. 
uh, we've got to start focusing on the tune. Meaning, just so you know, when I train somebody to to get uh, and try and get them to be believable, the first thing I do is remove all the words. And, and I'll show you the process I go through, but the words are almost getting in the way. And if you don't believe me, think about anybody who's learned the classic elevator pitch. Well, tell me about yourself. I am a person who offers companies and off we go. And now we'll write them. We'll, we'll practice them a little bit, but ask yourself, how many of you have actually ever used a prepared elevator pitch in real combat, in real live conversation? The answer is little to no one because we lose confidence in that. And, and you can massage and change the words all you want. It's again, it's the tune, it's the sound. Got to make, make a better sound there. So what we can do, one, you're going to see that for me at least in the writings I'm doing, I'm actually incorporating acting tips. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I understand that this tune may not be natural to you. So we're going to, we're going to teach you how to make it natural. Um, and we're going to uh, apply acting tips when we do. We're going to apply improvisational tips. Well, I'm a person who doesn't think very quickly on my feet. Okay, well, there's drills and skills. There's process behaviors that can improve your speed of thought. And actual musical tips, in a sense. And when I say musical, you're going to see slides coming up right now that deal with pitch, that deal with the sound and the, and the scales that we're actually applying. Now, please understand that I'm a person that believes that everybody has their unique style. So I'm not taking somebody who's at a two and making them a nine. I'm just going to move that bar. I'm going to take a two and I'll make it a five. I'm going to take somebody who's at a five, I'll make you a seven. So we're going to change that tune. We're not going to change the individual, but we're going to move that tune up a little bit. Okay. So as I said, how do we do it? What, what's that tune sound like? To me, you find it in what I call the three Ps. One is pitch. And we all know you can add emphasis to highlight a point simply by changing the pitch. So when the pitch goes up or the pitch goes down, that begins to change that tune, doesn't it? The pace, how we slow down, how we speed up to grab people's attention. And then finally, pausing. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. But strategically pausing just briefly can truly intensify the message. Remember what we're after here. We're after trying to help people become more authentic. So why would we just blow through a stop sign? Somebody were actually answering a question that you asked that they had some sensitivity to it. Why would you Im instantly fire another question? To me, it doesn't sound like you're listening. So let's break them apart a little bit. Uh, pace. You've got a pace. Okay, we all have a pace. Just so you know, when you speak faster, it tends to signal urgency. It, it tends to show that you're excited. But, but we never want to just stay at that pace. When you slow down, now you're taking, now you're beginning to hit something a little more important, significant ideas. But you see the combination of both, that's what's going to make you easier list, to listen to. So imagine starting to actually think about where you're going to change the pitch, where you're going to change the pace. And then finally, where you're going to apply your pauses. I actually personally believe it's one of the most undervalued communication tools that people use. It's extremely powerful when you pause. And yet people get, particularly when we're anxious, they get nervous about pausing. They feel like too much dead space, you know, like a, like a wine. We're just going to let these words breathe a little bit. So it's powerful. It allows you to stay in the moment. Again, I'm talking about trying to be authentic in, in some rather serious conversations. Maybe it's a business conversation. Maybe it's a personal conversation, but uh, we're not at the pool right now. We're, we're talking about real critical conversations. When, you, when somebody says something to you and you pause, it allows you to mentally stay in the moment. And again, adds a little bit more power to that conversation, demonstrates effective listening, and allows you to connect at a much deeper level. And, it, and, and what are we after here? Why people don't believe you? All I'm trying to get at is manufacturing a way to be more believable. Now, 
All that said, let me give you a couple performance tips. And to me, it's it's almost the secret sauce because because I you know we can't, I can't mark up everybody's piece of paper. You can't right before a conversation go in and immediately start figuring out. Okay, I'll, pitch, I'll move my pitch up here. I'll take my pause down there. So you understand pitch, pace, and pause now. How do we do it on the fly? Well, that's to me almost the secret sauce of the book for me, which is I try and actually teach people the way I was taught as an actor, what their character is. So if you truly believe that you're an invaluable member of a team and you and you get into that character, you actually get into the way a method actor acts. Take yourself to a moment where you were, had tremendous success on a team or tremendous success as a presentation. It was so good that you knew any presentation you would give would be as good, if not better. Well, maybe we're slumping right now. Why can't we get into character and as a method actor, bring back that moment? Now the pitch, now the pace, now the pause begin to follow. And as they say, the body doesn't know when the mind is acting. All this begins to follow as well. Okay, so I wanted to go about 15 to 18 minutes for you. I'm going to pause now. I want to thank you all for listening. I hope that was some, some nice little bit of help for you. And now what we'll do is we'll move into um, a, a, a Q&A, just some questions that you might have. So fire away and I'm ready to go. All right. Thank you, Rob. That was wonderful. That was a great little summary of a lot of the key points that you hit in the book. Um, I particularly liked what you said in the very beginning, uh, really in getting people to believe you, you have to be authentic. And when you think so much about how you're saying something and want to say it perfectly, it makes you inauthentic. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are have a little bit of imperfection, it makes you authentic and therefore more trustworthy. So I think that is a really valuable um, key point to kind of summarize the very first place to go in terms of how to become more believable. Yeah, you know, there's a piece in the book and it's a it's a piece I'm very proud of, which really deals with the fact that, um, first of all, imperfection is very relatable. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, uh, at my party, uh, I prefer to have people that aren't quite so perfect. It's very relatable. I think we're our own worst enemy. And the second point is, and it's a, it's a classic phrase that's been used uh, throughout time, but we have to remember that we all walk with a limp. We all have a limp. Uh, and the only two people that don't have a limp that I've ever met are people who aren't honest or people who have absolutely zero capacity to have empathy for another individual. We can't run from our limp. We have to embrace it. And usually the only person at the end of the day who's concerned about that limp is ourselves. We remove that obstacle, we're in great shape. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question to kick us off. Um, you've already written five different books on selling and persuasion. What's the main difference between this new book and your previous books that you've written? Yeah, great question. Well, first of all, I'm absolutely guilty of falling into the same mistake that kind of everybody else did, which was um, particularly my first sales book, uh, was just A to Z on selling. Well, that's great, but there was no attention to tune. There was no attention to, uh, now you hear all these steps in the process and customer-centered selling has a 22-step process. I'm very proud of that. Uh, so I, we really break down selling, but there is no attention to tune. There's no attention to authentic behavior. And I'm the guy who always ran around saying, but we all sell, we all sell. And people go, <laughs> so, but I think the problem is that that book was written for salespeople that all, that sell, but the rest of us that really do need to, to grab these um, tactics and use them as a parent, as a friend, uh, at the PTA, uh, there's so many opportunities where persuasion and influence are necessary. I think people throw up their hands because they say, I'm not a natural salesperson. Now there's a book that sort of says, well, women, this is just a repeatable, predictable process. You can do this. But here's a little bit more on the tune, just in case that tune doesn't come naturally to you. We can work on that. So I, I think it sort of answered the other part of the question that I, I failed to answer 15 years ago. Yeah, that actually leads in really well to the next question, which is that obviously you wrote this book to help people help 
help people make themselves more believable. And I'm guessing you have a few scenarios specifically in mind. You mentioned the job, um, applying for a job, uh, giving a presentation. You know, what are some of the other scenarios that you think are most useful for this skill? And also, um, like who, again, you mentioned some of the people, parents, all different kinds of people, like who would be, who would get value out of reading this book? Yeah. Let's take the last part first. Who gets value? Now, book pal, I, I, I want you to just hang on because this is, this is going to give you all a heart attack because I will tell you in the book world, the worst thing you can do is write a book for everybody. <laughs> the worst thing you can do in business is say, I got a product for everybody. Uh, that That's one of the hardest concepts to actually sell. And yet I'm trying to figure out who should we knock off the list? So yes, salespeople, but you know, now let's get to the first part. Um, I'm already conducting training. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to list my clients. They're on my website. Um, but for instance, I'm dealing, I've been dealing with a client that deals with uh, collections and they, and they really, it's a wonderful group of people. Uh, these are people that specifically work for a company when and people are having difficulty with this particular product, that product gets taken. And uh, so they've learned a wonderful process of how to be, um, how, how to be empathetic and sympathetic, and, but it's all words. So think about it. How do you just read off a piece of paper? Here's where I'm going to be empathetic. Okay, I'm empathetic now. It's almost like watching an actor on stage try and cry. If you've ever watched an actor cry on stage, they're not usually yelling at themselves to cry. They're taking themselves to a moment that's very sensitive and deep, and they're in that moment, and they're feeling that feeling. So uh, so this is a classic example of collections departments. Anybody that has a job to do that requires uh, people to – a face-to-face -face or even a phone-to-face -face conversation where they've got to be authentic. So like I said, I'm trying to figure out who we knock off this list. Uh, but the last thing I'll tell you very quickly, and it was the, this first group that I ever worked with. First group I ever worked with was 12 people who uh, I wanted chronically unemployed. And I know I'm pushing back on that one again, but I do want you to know when I knew we had something working, the, the first group was uh, 12 people uh, minimum unemployed for three years, two thirds of class, five years unemployed. Uh, within three months, 10 of the 12 were hired. Uh, I'm very proud of that. I actually teach that program for that group once a year. Uh, I wish I could put more in. But uh, it, it, it's if you think about your business and you have any, any interaction, even a manager to an employee who is very, I'm writing, writing a piece that's coming out tomorrow about why top performers don't necessarily make top managers and these types of skills are never taught to them so they were able to move a widget faster or build something quicker but that doesn't mean they're a leader it doesn't mean they're a manager and it doesn't mean that they can get people to believe the words that they're saying so uh, I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna push back and say um warning rob jollis can't figure out who not to put on the list all right. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's anybody who needs to communicate effectively in a given scenario. So yeah, that is a lot of people can relate to that, I'm sure. So actually, I like that you brought up the topic of managers and training in um, in learning how to be a good manager. Uh, in the very last chapter, you wrote about the politics of success and the idea that office politics itself isn't inherently wrong. Uh, you said it's simply playing out of inner per, inner relationships within office environments. And it's funny because employers don't usually put things like getting along with people in their job descriptions, yet effective communication is so pivotal to everybody's success. Uh, why do you think there has been a slow, slowly growing shift towards this mentality over the past few years um, to place more emphasis on communication training for managers? Well, because think about the number one reason why people fail in a company. It's again, it's rarely that they weren't able to move object A to object B fast enough. It's they didn't fit in on the team. They um, they didn't know how to disagree with people. Uh, they were socially um, awkward or clumsy, and the manager was unable to help. Uh, the, you know, from a management standpoint, feedback was lopsided and cruel. 
Um, and that's for our star performers too, by the way. Um, star, our, our top performers will always say, and this is again, I'm, I, I do a lot of feedback coaching. Top performers will always tell you, ah, oh, just give it to me straight, <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, beware, uh, because nobody, nobody can handle uh, a ton of negative feedback and nothing positive. So what we're talking about here is um, it's logical, but it's not instinctive. And, and that's the, the issue. So that last part of the book, and I was so glad I could get my publisher on board because they sort of went, I don't get it. You seem to be making a right-hand turn here. How did we get to politics? And the problem is, remember that group of 12 I just boasted about? Uh, about eight, at least eight of them were back in that room three to four months later. I taught them how to be believable. I didn't teach them how to sustain it. And so I realized to really complete this puzzle, we don't have to, we don't, we, we, it's not just about learning to believe in ourselves, which is the first building block, and then learning to get others to believe in us. It's learning how to sustain it. And again, if the schools aren't going to teach it, and I know that the businesses aren't going to teach it, then somebody's got to teach people how to disagree with their manager, uh, how to read their manager. And, and, and again, the critical importance of fitting in a team. I tell you again, I'm on the front lines of, of getting people employed. You show me any job description, rare, there might be one out of 15 bullets that deal with team. I'm telling you it's 13 out of 15 bullets because what, the, what they're trying to figure out is I can teach you anything, but if you poison this team, you're gonna, you're gonna take us all down. So we have to teach people what is unfortunately not as instinctive as we'd like it to be. And that's why that section's in the book. And, I'm, and again, I'm grateful that Barrett Kohler um, put up with my nonsense and let me um, persuade the heck out of him to please allow me to have this in the book as well. Yeah, no, I'm glad they did too. I think it actually, it did make sense in the end because it's sort of a, okay, now you have some of these tools. This is a very specific you scenario that's going to come up for most people's lives in a professional setting and how to potentially address those situations. Uh, and I, um, I have to, I have to say, I had to talk about, um, your chapter on fear and response and how you wrote about professional golfers and how they don't check the scoreboards when they're in a tournament. And for that they, what they do is they play the course and not the opponent. I love that analogy, one, because I'm a golfer, so I can very much <laughs> relate to the mental struggle portion of the story. Um, but I also love the idea of applying that same mentality to what you do in a, in a professional environment, the, the concept of how your mind is holding you back in the same way if you were doing a physical sport, your mind can hold you back. And um, what are some tangible tips for tuning out those those mental distractions and things that you can't control, like right. what your competition is doing. Right. Well, the first thing is we have to out it, which you just did. Then we got to apply it. And uh, for instance, I'm actually crafting a presentation right now, and I, I think I'm going to call it isms. <laughs> because, um, listen, again, um, there's there, the world isn't always fair. Some people are, are um, have issues with, with ageism. And, uh, you know, in other words, there, there are certain people that just won't want to work with people because of their age. And sometimes it's based on their sex. And sometimes it's, it's based on their looks or their geographic location. So that particular point you brought up, which I'm pleased you did, uh, is a way of reminding people, much like that golfer, if you're dealing with somebody that, it, it, well, yeah, if you're dealing with somebody who has an issue with your age or, or your sex, uh, no amount of worrying about it is going to change the fact that that's their problem. That's their issue. So why are we taking that with us to our appointment? Why are we taking that with us to our interview? Uh, why are we obsessing on, on how unfair that is? All I can do is control, as, and you're a golfer, I'm just going to control my swing. I'm going to, so it's more of just mentally a mental reminder. Uh, there's another quote in there, um, not a Rob Jollis quote, but it's by my coffee bar uh, right in this house that says, worry is the misuse of your imagination. I love that quote. I look at it every day. Um, and I, I, again, the, the, the issue that this concept creates is worry. And so 
my just like you i why would i worry about somebody else's pot <laughs> they're going to hit it i if i thought worrying would actually change the trajectory of the pot i would intensely worry <laughs> but i can't i've got to focus on my pot i got to focus on what i'm doing and sometimes we're misusing our imagination and so we're really creating our own problem there so i think it's more of if you've ever heard of the four levels of conscious behavior. I think it's more of, to answer your question specifically, becoming consciously competent, consciously aware that uh, we're, we're allowing worry to creep in, we're filling in plot lines that don't necessarily exist, and um, all we've got to do is focus on our game. I'm going to focus on my ball, my ball strike, and uh, I'm going to shoot a 67 up there, and if you, if you can shoot lower, I'll come up and shake your hand. Uh, but no amount of worry about your game is going to help my game. Yeah, that's exactly right. I need to apply that um, to my golf game and my <laughs> my everyday job. So thank you for that advice. Well, that about wraps it up with the questions. I did want to take a second to just speak to you. For those who don't already know, that don't already know Rob, he is a sought-after speaker and best-selling author um, who spent over 30 years teaching, entertaining, and inspiring audiences worldwide. His keynotes and workshops are in global demand, including with companies in North America, Europe, Africa, and the Far East. And his best-selling books include How to Change Minds, Customer-Centered Selling, How to Run Seminars and Workshops, and The Road Warrior that have been translated into more than 12, or sorry, a dozen different languages, which is 12. And he, he and you currently reside in Chevy Chase, Maryland, correct? Yes, I'd like to say something too while we're closing. Um, yeah. Are you done with me, by the way? I didn't mean to cut you off. So I want to say something about you. And I don't have a sheet in front of me. <laughs> I have been uh, working in this industry and writing for many years. I've had um, five different uh, publishers. Um, and I value the relationship with BookPal. I value what you're trying to do. I think it's very exciting that you're bringing this kind of content to people. Um, and um, I applaud, I applaud BookPal. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. We really appreciate mm -hmm. it. All right. Well, that about uh, wraps everything up for today. Um, just so you guys know, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar next week, along with jo uh, with Rob's handout in attached to that email. And you can also visit our website at uh, www.book-pal.com why people don't believe you to purchase uh, the book for your organization I think we might have it on the next slide Rob if you switch it over oh there you go there you go so you can see the URL there um, or you know if you if you have a question a sales inquiry you can reach out to me at michelle at book-pal.com to learn more and you can sign up for our next author connect chat on June 4th uh, making some noise uh, if you go to the link right there and we'll send out all that information in our follow-up email as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rob. It was great chatting with you today. Loved it. Thanks. And thanks for all you do at BookPal. I really appreciate it. Be good. Thank you. Bye guys. <laughs>